you know, that other Bob Smith used to say, hey, kids, you know what time it is? It's time for the outdated wrestling hour. Connecticut is a hotbed of independent wrestling, and this gentleman has helped out in that regard. It's a great state. It's got a lot of great wrestling. So let's welcome, from Connecticut, Rick Del Santo. Well, a couple of months ago, a fine fellow asked if I would come on his podcast. And I said, sure, because it's PWC Pro Wrestle Zone. And uh, they're about to hit a milestone in a couple of months, and it is a podcast you've all got to check out because it is run by the professor, Rick Del Santo. Rick, welcome to my podcast. Great to have you here. Hey, Bob. Thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I'm I'm so glad. And you, you, you have been flattering me with kind words about this podcast, and I appreciate it because it's, it's, you know, as a fellow podcaster, you know what a struggle it can be. Absolutely. I've been scheduling doing and getting people to come on and people who say they're going to be there at eight o'clock don't show up at eight o'clock and on and on it goes. It can be frustrating, but it's also very re- rewarding. And I hope you feel that way because uh, we both talked we, before the show started and it looks like by September you're going to reach your 300th episode. Is that right? Yeah, 300 episodes. I am uh, extremely happy. I plan on doing a huge live episode on YouTube on that uh, particular evening. So. Uh, you know, I've, uh, booked a couple different guests to, to do that live episode. Uh, so it's going to be fun. You know, I'm looking forward to it. What I like about your show is they're from all over different facets of the, of the wrestling community and, and old wrestlers, young wrestlers like Mike Lane, you had Jacques Rougeau not long ago, which was a mm-hmm. great show. One of Thank my you. favorites, current guys, Wrecking Ball Ligurski, whose name still drives me crazy. I think that's <laughs> so 1970. I love it. You had A.J. Bertruzzi, who was with the WWF and later became an early ECW uh, star. Right. Mario Savoli and Brian Webster, which is my favorite show because I, I know those two gentlemen and that uh, brought back a lot of memories hearing them. So what's the process like for you putting this all together? It's got to be time consuming, but rewarding when you put out shows like that. You know, what's the process? I literally just uh, – sometimes I sit there and I don't know how I choose or how I decide who I'm going to – look for it's just you know i'll be talking to a friend and be like hey maybe this guy's around i gotta you know and uh, i've been trying to get mario savoldi for a couple of years now and i'm glad that uh you know they just uh they just dropped their ultimate classic uh network that they have on mm-hmm. Roku. so mm-hmm. the timing was kind of right you, you know the uh the person that was setting up all the podcasts and stuff like that uh reached out to me and i was static to have him and brian webster you know he's not an easy guy to find so I was glad to have Brian as well because I was always a big fan of his work and uh, the IWCCW, who's a great, great commentator, I thought. Uh, probably underrated. Oh, me but, too. And, yeah. And, and you know what's funny? Back then, I don't know, even know how I ended up doing it. I sat next to him four or five times, him and Mike Mittman. Another time it was an entire taping with just me and him. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know how this all fell together. We barely had time to talk to each other before the, the camera started rolling. And it just seemed natural with him. He's a, he was great. I thought he was headed for huge things. Who knows what his you know career motivations or goals were, but he was really good on that show. He really was very professional. And uh, I just enjoyed being with him and learning about IWCCW from him because he, he knew all the ins and outs and nooks and crannies of what Mario was trying to do at that point. Yeah. And uh, I got to tell you, it was a complete honor to sit there with those two gentlemen it, uh, to learn about uh, all the stuff that Mario had gone through over the years in the wrestling business. It was, it was simply amazing, to tell you the truth. I, I, felt, I might as well have been interviewing Vince McMahon at that point. Like that was the equivalent for me. I think one of my great moments was when they went to Hamburg for a while, right? I think they were taping in yep. Hamburg. Yeah. The same arena that the WWE and even Joe McHugh was doing the ring announcing. I mean, come mm-hmm. on. 
I yeah. stood in the same spot Mr. McMahon used to, to stand during interviews. And I'm like, holy smokes. I just felt the history in the building and I, I sent chills up my spine. I'm serious. It's one of my great fun times. And I got to talk to, you know, interview Greg Valentine and Tony Atlas and Boston bad boy, most underrated manager of all time, Tony Rumble. Uh, yeah. Just, just it, when it was good, it was really good. Him and uh, you just mentioned Tony Rumble. Him and Brian worked really well together. I thought when they did the wraparounds on the uh, on the show and when they did commentary together, I thought they worked really well together. I like them all as a team. Because mm-hmm. you know, ICW and IWCCW went through so many permutations. I mean, if you go back, let's say a ten year span, and look at it from one point to another. They had a whole mess of different hosts recording mm-hmm. in different areas. I think the best was at the end, to be honest with you. Do you agree with that? Or That's when I got really, really into it. I, uh, the, you mm-hmm. know, I had discovered it in the 1980s, probably 87, 88. Uh, I think I might have told you this story on my podcast, but I discovered it on the on my grandmother's house on some weird Sunday morning or Saturday or Sunday morning. And um, I did not know what it was. At that time, I had only seen WWF and NWA and AWA, probably world class too at that time. I discovered that and I literally just like kind of went nuts. I said they had a unique roster. It was just something like I've never seen before as far as wrestling. There was just something very special about it. And then over the years, you know, uh, they would, I guess, not be available in my area at times and then come back every so often. But when I moved in, I mean, my, uh, I guess it was me and my ex-wife moved to uh, Woodbridge, Connecticut. I used to get it on a low-power UHF station for like the last, like I guess, a year or two. And there was just <laughs> something really, really cool about that because it was wrestling on on that station. It was wrestling seven nights a week. I used to get the USWA Memphis up here. I used to get Smoky Mountain. Uh, I think Global might have been available at the time on the station as well. There was a couple others. I, I just can't think of it because it was so long ago, but... It was just so cool to be able to watch that. And it was just, it was very unique. They used a lot of original talent and they used a lot of, uh, you know, they would bring in a lot of guys. Coco Beware would come in there, you know, Valentine, like you said, it, it was really cool. You know what they don't get credit for? And I'm going to give them credit for it right now. It's only 30 years too late, <laughs> but they may have been the last wrestling federation that you could take your two kids, put them in the car and say, we're going to go see wrestling. Yeah. Yay. And the whole family could enjoy it. There was nothing on those shows that was, was unseemly, no bad language. But today's indies are kind of coarse. You know what I'm saying? For the most part, uh, there's a a lot of wrestling out there that is not family friendly. Uh, right. I'm fortunate enough to one of the groups that I work with is, uh, you know, we just had this whole pre-production meeting uh, the other night and we just basically said no swearing, none of this other stuff. Uh, there's going to be kids in the crowd. And that I respected that a lot because it just it meant a lot to me because you know I bring my kids to the show when I'm working a show, so right. always my right. seven year olds always me more there. About, tell me more about who you're working with. This is interesting. I work for a company called uh, Coliseum Pro Wrestling. I do commentary for them. Uh, they're about a year old. This isn't the only one I work with, but uh, but uh, they are run by uh, a couple guys out of here, uh, New Haven area, Connecticut, and they run. Um, it's all local guys. Uh, we just did a taping for uh, which a, a future broadcast is going to come out. It's uh, this was probably the best show we've ever ever done. Literally, it's uh, it's a new organization. There's a lot of uh, Mancini and uh, trained guys out there. Mario Mancini, that's what I'm referring to. Mm-hmm. Trained and right. Roma trained guys that work there. There's a lot of guys that are trained by Slick Wagner Brown that work there. It is just a fun fun promotion to work for. And we've you know I worked the cameras there a couple times. Now finally. Uh, Recorded a whole the whole show for a stream, an upcoming stream. So I want everybody to look at look for that. That's going to be a lot of a uh, a lot of fun. I think uh, for I think a lot of people will enjoy this. How can people find it? Uh, you can go to YouTube Coliseum Pro okay. Wrestling. You can go to Instagram Coliseum Pro Wrestling, all one word. And of course, you can go to my Instagram and you'll see me plug the hell out of it every five <laughs> minutes, probably. You know, every time something is announced. I'll upload that same flyer for days and, you know, different taglines because I want everybody to be there. The last show was probably the biggest show we ever had. And I just want a lot of people. I just want people to enjoy uh, good professional wrestling. And that's what we're about. There you go. And I think that this audience that we have for this show would be interested in that. I know I am. You're hyping it. Now I want to check it out because I have not seen it yet. So uh, 
Thank you, you for the information. I think it's really I, cool. You come if you come, let me know and I'll take care of you. So Oh. <laughs> My goodness, I haven't heard I'll take care of you since the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, how'd you get started in all this stuff? And let's go back a few years. I mean Obviously, uh, your podcast career isn't the beginning of your of your uh, okay. association with professional wrestling. Take me back to the yeah. earliest days and how you decided you, this was for you. That it's something you want to pursue. Okay, I had lost interest in professional wrestling for a couple of years, probably about two years, maybe three, uh, when I divorced my first wife. You know, I just kind of sat in my new apartment and did not do much. But there came a time I was, you know, I was, uh, I worked in a record store still. Now, I know that you and I uh, were talked about that last yes. time on my show that we were both uh, managing record stores. That's there right. There used to be uh, uh, people that I would make friends with that were customers. And, and I know somebody that uh, used to talk on time. He had a radio station on public radio. Now, I did college radio earlier than that, like a bunch of years back. But he had a radio show on uh, um, public radio. He asked me to come by. He wanted me to be a guest on a show. So I did numerous times until I became a regular part of that show for about a good year. And then he decided to move uh, out to California because he got a job in the music industry. So I basically said, I wanted to start my own thing. I started looking into it, into it. And then uh, I guess that's where it's, "Ah, maybe I'll just do a podcast, music podcast. And then, uh, well, (laughs) lo and behold, I ended up meeting my second wife in that time period. And her son was really into WWE at the time. I took him to an event, and it was cool. Had a lot of fun. It was the first probably wrestling event I'd been to in years, uh, live at least. Um, what and then year are we it, looking at there? 2013, 2014. Oh, okay. Maybe. Not that long ago. Yeah, okay. not that long ago. Like I said, I only lost, I didn't lose interest. I just had not – it wasn't surrounded by, by it for a couple of years, you know, uh, to keep up on it. So there's a, there's a good chunk of like three or four years. I don't know what the hell happened, but um, – so uh, what ended up happening one day on my way to work, probably about 2018, and now I'm kind of watching regularly now because of my uh, my now wife's um, son. Regularly about 2018, I ran into Paul Rome at a gas station here. <laughs> so on my way to work, and he invited me down to one of his shows, him and Mario Mancini run a school here. And I had the time of my life. I literally did. It was the first show I'd been to in like uh, – indie show I'd been to in years and I uh, had a blast and I ran into a lot of people I had known in wrestling before that at uh, uh, at this show and I got home and I said hey I'm just going to start a pro wrestling podcast and that was it and it just kind of took off from there I started uh, doing like 10-15 minute blurbs and just releasing them out on Spotify. So what year did you start the I think we're going PWZ. on three years now just three years you have that many yeah. shows well I, wow there was a time i was pushing them out like tons but now i just hold them down to once a week so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, so. I found out really early on you can't do these too fast because it's like no. they will eat you up sometimes yeah. you, you, guys i gotta tell you to do a one hour show can take three days of work <laughs> am i right or wrong yeah. Am I right yeah i try to uh sometimes i'll just record them and i'll forget to download them and then edit them. They'll be sitting there. I was like, oh, crap. I don't have an episode coming out. I would drop them every Monday now. So I got, you know, there was one last week. I was like, oh, crap. I forgot. I don't have an episode for uh, Monday. But I <laughs> but I have like eight in the can. So I just, I get, and then I just ended up, I was like, this one's perfect. So I just pulled one. I said, this is the one that's coming out. So. Right, right. Yeah. How do you choose your guests? I'm more of an old school guy. You know, uh, similar to you, like I just, uh, I look for people. I don't know. I just, something will come to my head. I got a friend, Anthony, he'll be like, hey, why don't you interview this guy? Sometimes I'll talk to uh, certain guys at the Savoldi office, you know, working currently. and be like, hey, do you ever think about interviewing this guy? And I'll be like, okay, 100% if you put me in touch with him. And that's happened quite a few times. And then, uh, of course, a lot of uh, guys end up being guests from my local New England area. I will choose a lot of guys. Uh, from there, try to give them the platform, get their name out there a little bit more. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So uh, you're old school, but you're pushing the young talent at the same time, which is kind of unique. Well, you know, I think that I love professional wrestling in New, New England and, and actually in Northeastern in New England. Uh, New England has a really rich history. So I just want to get these young guys to be a part of that history and be remembered in a way. What's the scene like there? Because I've never been. Um, no. In terms of the tone of the of the promotions, is it 
is there hardcore promotions? Is it more family friendly? Is it um, traditional or is it modern with a lot of goofy goings on in the ring, a la Kenny Omega and his blow up doll? I mean, what, <laughs> what, what can people expect? That I've never seen on a show here, but uh, uh, I have seen a guy wrestle a tent. So, um, Excuse, wait, hold up. Why? Yes. Yep. 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 Say that again. A, a wrestle a tent. Yes. Here in Connecticut. Yeah. A pop up tent. He no wrestled lie. a pop up tent. Yes. Yep. You don't need to see anything else. <laughs> I almost walked out. I mean, you know, me being the traditional wrestling fan that I am, old school. But, you know, there is a variety of professional wrestling here. You can go to a show and see all sorts of stuff here in Connecticut. I mean, Sometimes you go to a show, there will be a match that's a little bit on the hardcore side. Nothing deathmatchy or that right. insane, nothing right. like that. Right. I mean, I guess there is, uh, there has been some deathmatch guys have do do come through the state. Uh, but, you know, there's just, that's not my scene, really. You know, I don't like that stuff. I'm very traditional. I love watching two guys get out there and grapple. I'm not into the flippity floppity stuff either. Mm -hmm. I just like mm -hmm. good old school grappling. Arn Anderson, you know what I mean? That's a perfect example right. of what right. I like. Right. You know, yeah. it's funny. I, I, New York State here, I have to assume there isn't a lot of hardcore, and I don't hear about it, mainly because the State Athletic Commission is too tough on them. Yeah. I don't think they would allow half the things that a lot of the states, I don't know if the states look away because they're getting some tax revenue from it or if they just don't know. Other right. states don't may not even have athletic commissions, you know. So uh, it's a situation where it's fluid. But oh God, what goes on in the name of indie wrestling around the country right now is kind of embarrassing. I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, I do. I even do. the names, even the names of the organizations are offensive. It, it's listen again. I'm not a prude. Everybody go out and do what you want to do. But when, yeah. when you're straying too far from what professional wrestling is supposed to be, that's when I take umbrage about well, it. I like the names that similar to like what you're getting at, you know, the worldwide wrestling federation, the national wrestling alliance, stuff like that. It's when you're insane championship wrestling or hardcore wrestling and blah, blah, blah. Everything's, there's also a million wrestling organizations that start with the word extreme. You know what I mean? Right. It's just, uh, it's just not my bag. You know, I mean, I could, you know, back in the day I was in the ECW, but after a while I, uh, I lost a lot of interest in it. You know, but you know, and, even, and the yeah. even the biggest was faded. Even the biggest was ECW yeah. went away. FMW, yeah. you know, it, it all goes away. Why? You, the problem is, it's always Craig Peters said this best, but he's on the show from PWI. Yep. Up, 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 hotter, bigger, stronger, faster, more dangerous, more bloody. Up, up, up. You can only go so far up. You you can't risk life, limb, and you know, the whole profession in search of a big spot. It just doesn't work. And that's what's kind of hurt things like AEW and stuff like that now too. People are more worried about the spots than the match. Yeah. I've, uh, I started watching that at first and, you know, for a while I was, it's good, but it needs, it's got a lot of kinks to work out. And now it's what, five years in and it's just not good to me. You know, there's a lot of, they, it's, and it's unfortunate. They have a lot of really good talent there, but it's like watching a train wreck each and every week. <laughs> I know it's meticulously organized, but right. it looks like it's not. Yeah. It always looks like they threw a whole mess of stuff together right before they went on the air. That's what it looks like to me. Well, you it reminds me of the, the dying days of the AWA. You know, whoever shows up is what we'll do. Yeah, that's that's who's getting booked. But, uh, you know, there was a match, I think, at the it was the last Ring of Honor pay-per-view where I think it was a Lucha Brothers and what the hell is that other tag team? Top Flight, I think they are. You know, so mm -hmm. me and a bunch of friends will get together and watch the pay-per-views together. I don't watch the weekly TV because it's just a headache. I can't keep up on everything. That's There's so much weekly TV. But then it was like this one spot. There was like a million tables set up. And I think, you know, one of the guys went for something. And the guy, uh, Dante Martin, broke his ankle on the landing because he put him, he was put through something like six tables. I mean, that's to me, that's unnecessary right. to be doing stuff like that. I just, I don't appreciate that stuff. Uh, to me... The, the tables, the weapons, all that funky stuff. It's just not professional wrestling to me. But you know what bothers me about all of the major league wrestling now? It's so freaking noisy. There's, there's never you can never it, there's never time to take a breath. There's never any silence. There's never the sound of the two grapplers in the ring. It's you know, explosions and noise and screaming announcers and screaming wrestlers and talk inside the ring that's mic'd. 
That never happened in our day. No. You know, the thing conversations about, um, in the ring that you can hear. Right. And you, you know, the one thing about that is it's – look at Gordon Soley. He's very calm and collected, and he, mm -hmm. he sold it very well by being calm and collected. And he very rarely raised his voice. But when he did, it wasn't like, you know, Michael Cole or what have you, screaming at the top of his lungs. Right. That's the one thing I have. And I hate to say it because um, uh, do you watch current NWA at all or have you? I, yes. Um, yeah. I really got hooked before the pandemic and then the pandemic yeah. came along and kind of smushed it. And yeah. I've been rooting for it, but I, I've become disillusioned at what I'm seeing, to be honest with you. Well, it's it's picked up a little bit. I think they, a little bit. It's And I don't mean like, you know, it's not great, but they have some really great talent there. And But the one thing about it is I think their announcer, Joe Galley, I think is a very good announcer, but they're leaning towards the size, the side, excuse me, of uh, sports entertainment a little bit too much. Now, there's a lot of goofiness going on there. Uh, but when there's always constant action at the end of the episode, and you remember the old attitude era where there was always something crazy happening at the end of the show and the announcers had to scream. So Joe Galley is automatically screaming. And I'm just like, he's a very good announcer when he's not screaming. And the screaming ruins his momentum, I think. I think he's, mm. you know, it just, it makes him less good. Here's what I'll know that the NWA has made a full comeback. When they do a pay per view in front of five thousand people instead of two hundred and fifty, I hate to say it. That was the last paper, not the last paper. The pay per view before they did. Uh, it was. Uh, I checked in with uh, somebody that was there, and they said that it was sold out. They kept amping it up as it was being sold out, and I'm like, that was an awfully small room. And then I have a friend that was there. I texted him. I said, "How many people are there?" He's like, "This room fits two hundred and fifty people." I was like, "That's ridiculous! Like, literally ridiculous." Yeah, they don't it even. Just... It's like they don't even try. Well, I you see this is why I don't get a lot of what the motivation is there in a bunch of different ways. Yet I root for them. Me too. Yet Me I too. root for them. And I, you know what? I mean, I'm rooting for everything. Yeah. You know, I, I'm hoping that clearer heads prevail. And um, <sighs> you and I talked about it before, the suspension of disbelief, my friend. You lose it and you lose everything. That's my yeah. two cents. That's That's my whole – bugaboo about my, or not modern wrestling but today's wrestling because if you're watching a show you can watch a show on netflix you can watch a show on nbc go on yeah. order anything you want if it's not a sport and it's a show people are like, tired of it i i just i just don't think you can sustain interest if the sport element goes too far away that's just my two cents and that's the way professional wrestling for the most part is these days it's not promoted as a sport and that's very unfortunate for people that look for it as a sport. Like myself, I always consider it a sport. You know, I got a young kid that busts my chops every day that, oh, these actors out here, my young, my 13-year-old uh, son. And it's just, you know, it's like he's not that wrong, really. You know what I mean? A lot of it. I mean, I'm not going to take away any of the credit that some of these guys have as far as athleticism. But a lot of it is just you have to learn how to be an actor on top of being a professional wrestler. You, you you hearten me because you, you talk about Connecticut, New England, as if it's kind of a hotbed for some of the traditional styles that still manage to hang on to this day. Connecticut has a lot of professional wrestling currently. There's, I think, about seven or eight groups here now. Really? Currently? Yeah. Yeah. And there's not a weekend that goes by that there's not a wrestling show anymore. Like, very rarely is there. And sometimes there's three shows in a night. That so you're gonna you the consumer has to choose which show to go to. Obviously, there's a bigger company out here that brings in all the stars, uh, you know. So a lot of people will go to that. But then there's like guys that are dedicated to certain groups that will go to those groups. Wow, that sounds like 1993, not 2013. <laughs> it does. Right. It sounds you're like right. the old days. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there was like back then, there was a lot of independent groups out back then. There was a uh, Especially in the area, it was is in any state really. Like uh, independent wrestling back then was such an awesome thing compared to like what it became with all the craziness. I love mm -hmm. old school independent wrestling, like watching the Savoli Group. You know, it's just it's amazing to watch that stuff. The most fun I had between the Savoldis and a lot of the indie undercards. You know, even a, even a card like the uh, 
Bob Backlund, Terry Funk match in some northern state. I don't remember where it was right. back around 92 was that you got to meet the kids on their way up and take yeah. their picture for the magazines. And they were all thrilled to get their picture taken. Right. You know, because it's like, these are tomorrow's stars. You don't, you don't know which one of them is going to burst out of there. That was the fun of it. Yeah. Going back to my office and seeing some guy in any show and go, hey, we got to cover this guy. You know, it was that feeling. I, I got to go to Memphis for a week once and came back and said, we got to cover this guy, Rob Stokowski. You know who he became? It was Rob yeah, Van Dam. Yeah, Rob Van Dam. Yeah. And I just saw him in an opening match against Danny Davis in Memphis. And I said, it's the greatest opener I ever saw. And I still feel that way. It's the best opener I ever saw. We got to cover this guy. And they let me do it. That was the yeah. fun of that job because I introduced the world to a lot of people back then in the introducing column and, and inside wrestling. Another one was Sid Vicious. Yeah, I, I gave him his first. Uh, these guys will never remember this, but I, I know this was the first national publicity that both of those guys got, and a lot yeah. of other ones too. Um, I remember, so I'm, I'm um, happy with that. I'm going to go back to your Rob Van Dam thing right there, but I remember the first time I ever saw him. Do you remember the IWF that used to air on the Sports Channel? I believe it was yes. Sports Channel America. Mm -hmm. First sure. time I ever saw him was there, and he was pretty much a preliminary guy there. Uh, same right. thing with like. Uh, Jason Knight, I saw him there. You know, uh, when that promotion was on TV, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. I was like, there was Lightning Lou Perez. Here's Tommy Rogers as a singles wrestler because the, the Fantastics had broken up. Uh, Mick Foley was there. Sonny Beach was. That to me was great independent wrestling. It was awesome. Right. DDP right. was an announcer there, you know? Mm -hmm. That's great. how DDP got. So people, people don't realize he did stuff like um, he was the boxing ring announcer, DDP was. Yeah. Did you know yeah. that? I read his autobiography, the first one that came out like, what, 20-something years ago, 25 years ago? Man, he is the yeah. ultimate rags to riches story. He really is. Yeah. Yeah. He fought he's his a, way for everything he ever got. And he's a hell of a cool guy on top of it, dude. He really, he really is. is. He's a legitimately yeah. cool guy. Yeah. No question. Speaking yeah. of cool guys, my friend, you're one of those too. And <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> on top of all this, what else you got going on? Let me hype yourself. Tell me what, hype myself. what's a happening and what's going to happen soon. I did an interview with uh, downtown Denny Brown recently, and that's going to be dropping next Monday, uh, the 19th. So that was one I I had a blast doing. I just hit him up uh, via social media, and we had a great conversation. And, you know, he was a very cool dude. He had a lot of really great stories, and that was awesome. But um, I recently spoke with a guy that, has, that I'm going to be doing a first. I've done a lot of firsts for podcasts, believe it or not, which is – one of the things I find very interesting, AJ Petruzzi uh, was one that never did a podcast and I hit him up and he didn't really say, you know, I don't know. I guess it's time I started doing podcasts because people have asked and I'm lucky enough that I was the first to, to do it. The same thing with Sonny Blaze and Sonny Blaze, um, you know, I got to thank Mario Mancini for putting in a good word for both of those, for me, for both to both of those gentlemen. Uh, about that because uh, they probably would not have done my podcast otherwise. I thought Sonny Blaze had an amazing story because Mario was good friends with both of them. And I know Mario uh, pretty well because, you know, he runs a school here. I've frequented his shows for the last four years, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so having him put in a good word kind of meant a lot to me. And uh, Sonny Blaze's story is an awesome. I know you had him on your podcast too, right? Yeah, recently, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's a great he's got great great stories. Uh and um let's see, this coming Monday I'll be talking to first ever podcast, to my knowledge, at least according to him, Phil Apollo, who's been kind of missing for Phil Apollo. Yeah, for many, many years. You know, he had a really great run in with the Savoldis. He had a really, really uh cool run with uh world class and Let's see, what else did he do? He did a lot of other stuff. He spent many years in the WWF as a underneath guy. Now, how far do you go back, being that this is the outdated wrestling hour, how far do you go back in terms of your first knowledge? What did you watch? Did you watch it as a kid like I did? I did. And got hooked on it? Well, Was it I, WWF or? Of course, yeah. I lived in Connecticut. That's home of WWF. And uh, uh, I started watching – Roughly 1983, 1984. Had to be 1984. Uh, wrestling, professional wrestling was exploding. WWF was exploding. Um, I didn't really get hooked, like really hooked for a couple of years. But I, uh, my cousin was watching it. I just remember Roddy Piper being on the TV. I thought he, this guy was amazing. Uh, I started buying magazines. I liked it enough. I liked it a lot and I would watch it every week. But 
it wasn't until my very first live show in 1988 that I literally became obsessed. And it's like, this is the most amazing thing ever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, went to New Haven I'm, Coliseum. I, I, I'm obviously a lot older than you are. And uh, <laughs> it was the same way for me in the seventies, man. I, I was such a wrestling fan that I was buying wrestling magazines when we had no local show on TV. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that being a fan in your uh, I'm still buying, yeah. Well, Pedro Martinez was. I'm from the Albany area, and his NWF was being promoted there, and they stopped. They stopped mm -hmm. coming to Albany mainly because they're probably losing their shirts. I don't even know why, because they were based in Cleveland or whatever, right? And so for about eighteen months, two years, we didn't have anything on at all. But I, I still, still kept reading the wrestling magazines. The only way I could learn about what was going on, I was hooked on it, even though I couldn't see it. Imagine that feeling, you know? That was, that was kind of rough. It's, it's so amazing to think about that, and you compare that to today. How much professional wrestling is on television today, mm -hmm. just on cable TV? Wrestling is on every night of the week on cable TV. Now put in all the other uh, streaming networks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's insane. It's completely it's everywhere. insane. It's yeah. Everywhere. Anytime somebody like Dave Dynasty or Chris P. Lettuce, the guys who were putting all this stuff out, <laughs> that guy, unco yeah. uh, uncover something that you've never seen or you didn't even know was available, your yeah. head just explodes. Like, where the heck is he finding that, 1970s Grand Prix tapes from the, Canada? The guy, the guy that you, know, you just incredible. mentioned, the guy that you just mentioned, Chris P. Lettuce, his network, his YouTube channel, I have to say, I've learned in the last, what, year that, he, that I've discovered him? Right. He has some of the craziest, weirdest professional wrestling that you could think of. And I don't mean weird as in weird, but it's like some one-off promotion. You know what I mean? Or something that had TV for six yeah. months or something like that. And it's just like you could – that is just a treasure of a channel. It he really had, is. He had he had Dominic Danucci's 1982 yes. spinoff federation, but ran for about six weeks. Yeah, and and there it is. And like, how did he get this? Where did he find it? That's my that's my question because I would yeah. love to know where this guy's finding all this stuff. Because he, for guys like us, he literally has everything. He had Gary Hart's Texas Wrestling out there for on his uh, right. on his station. And right. I had never seen it before. And then I come out there. Here's gorgeous Gary Young. Here's Steve Austin. Here's I was like, I don't know Steve Austin was in any, you know, outside of world class, you know, before he went to uh, WCW, all this weird stuff. And I'm sitting there and then I just See, have to I, do I, research. I need to, know, I need to learn more about that particular thing you're talking about because I'm yeah. not, not certain that they weren't interrelated somehow. It's very possible. That world class. It's very, it's very possible. Because I, I think that maybe Texas All-Star – was the local show okay as opposed to a national one that they went into syndication with okay That's because there was too many yeah. of the same guys at the same time right even angel right. at that you know all those guys that were part of the you know scott casey the whole bunch of them yeah, yeah. and i have a feeling that that may have been wcc you know world championship or, or excuse me world class championship without calling it that well some of it is you know some of the information you just can't find because right. it's so 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 out there that there's no way to find out about it, and it's like you have to know somebody that was around <laughs> yeah. working there at that time period to know. So amazing, that's the, it amazing. Is. So between is. Dave Dynasty and Chris P. Lettuce, guys, get to YouTube because you know what? Absolutely. If you if you're tired of what you're seeing on cable, stream. Yeah. Get yeah. a streamer. Get a Roku box. Get whatever you need to get, or go on YouTube and watch it on your tablet or your phone. Because I'm telling you, there's some magic stuff out there you've never seen before. Not only it's, that, but you can look at Pat O'Connor versus Buddy Rogers if you want to. You know, I just watched it, that it, a couple weeks back. I don't. There you go. Yeah, I posted it to my YouTube. Yeah, we or to all my, uh, refer tele. to that yeah. stuff. We all go back yeah. to it. Well, any, any what, who's we all? Who am I talking to? You know, I I, it's fan, like I was a real fans. You know, yeah, the, <laughs> so. yes, the people who have memories and. The people that uh, the federations have forgotten because we have gray chin hairs. You know, it seems like they're not selling to us. No, no, they don't sell to us. You know, they want you to buy the T-shirts and what they call the championship titles. You know, send not, send all your money for the, you know. I've got two belts in my collection and I'm not buying. They're not, excuse me, they're not modern belts. I own an AWA world title. Uh, the Bachwinkle one towards the end, and I have the uh, and I have the ten pounds of gold. I don't need anything else really, unless it's going right. to be some like uh, regional 
territory title. Now, That's here's it. Here's a funny thing about wrestling fans. Are you a, like, looking behind you, you, your fans can't see this, but he's got some yeah. beautiful artwork yeah. of people like Harley Race and beautiful painting looking things. There's Jerry Lawler photo that's autographed yep. and all kinds of stuff. Now I'm a funny, I'm a funny case. You you know how much I love old wrestling. Yeah. I, co- I collect nothing. <laughs> I, 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 it's just, I, for some reason, my, I think my memory is so good that I feel I don't, it's just a personal yeah. thing that I don't need memorabilia because I was kind of there, mm-hmm. you know? So it's all in my heart and in my head. I don't have to really have reminders of it, but I do respect people who, have these amazing collections. I, I know one guy here in New York that has 2,500 wrestling autographs on all different kinds of things, paper bags and index cards. And, and but he's got every star you can name. I'm like, I, how um, much time did you spend collecting these things? You yeah, know? Well, I went through a phase a few years ago, uh, probably the beginning of the pandemic where I was just like watching live streams, people selling stuff. And I would just like buy, 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 buy. That's where that Harley race came from. That's where the Lawler came from. Like a mm-hmm. Eric Embry and Bill Mercer behind me. Those I'll probably keep, you know, I, then recently I started like, man, I bought way too much. I don't really care about this. I don't care about this. So I ended, I started getting rid of some of it. Some of it I'll bring to shows and sell. But my main thing is collecting old programs, magazines, and pictures. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Tom Burke. Oh, yeah. the legend, the yeah. legend. Yeah, I actually visited his shrine not so long ago, and I was amazed by everything I saw. It was about 45 minutes from me. Um, but I buy – when he has his auctions, I bought – and I buy a lot of stuff from him with magazines from the 50s and 60s, pictures, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. I've got flyers from USWA and you know all sorts of weird stuff that he's uh, put up at auction and – that's the stuff I'm going to keep because that's the stuff I'm most interested in. All these autographs, I don't really necessarily care about that. You know what I mean? I've got mm-hmm. the Buddy Rogers uh, record book sitting here that I got from him a bunch of years ago. Wow. Um, so, yeah, man, it's just that's the stuff I actually care about. Over the time, I started weeding through my collection. I just don't care about the the autograph portion, except for that Harley race and the Lawler. So, you know. You, you know, you brought up something. I have a short list of people I haven't met that I'd like to meet. Mm-hmm. I would absolutely love to meet Tom Burke, extend my hand and say thank you. Yeah. One of the people who educated me about professional wrestling when I was a kid. He goes back that far. I no, mean, he, I don't know how yeah. old he is, but he goes way back. And he was one of the main magazine guys that I remember. And I'm telling you, his name was all over. And I get sentimental just hearing his name. I, I, and I see his his postings on Facebook and stuff like that, and I'm like, wow, he's still at it. You know, it just makes me feel good. It makes me happy because these are the guys that when it when it was important, when you schemed to get tickets, when you went yeah. places with your teenage friends to go see wrestling. You know, those were the days. Yeah, and that guy's wealth of knowledge is just amazing. I mean, I literally think everybody knows who that guy is. Everybody. Yeah. You know, William yeah. Regal has referred to him before in interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, that part is amazing right there, I think. Um, you know, and it's just, he's got. Well, there's he's the two. Some, it's Burke and my friend Apter, you know, Bill yeah. Apter. I, I just think that they are the real giants of pulp wrestling magazine publishing. There's no question about that. There's no question yeah. about it. They, you know, they had two entirely different styles. Tom was more meat and potatoes, you know. Stanley Weston was more lurid and florid, whatever, you, you know. Storytelling. The, 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 of, more yeah. storytelling. But they both had their place and they're both just giants, absolute giants, yeah. you know. Yeah. It, to me, they are anyway. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of other people that feel that way too. We grew up on those magazines, man. And I'm telling you, they never get old. Anytime I spot an old wrestling magazine, I'm like, I zip over to it and start reading it. And it's like, wow, it brings back all those memories. It's funny. I have boxes here. And I know I've sent you pictures of clips of like I'm looking through them randomly. I'm like, oh, shit, that's Bob, you know? And right, so I'll take right. a picture and I'll send it to you. But anytime I see, like, say if I'm at the flea market, a, a thrift store, and I see a stack of wrestling magazines, it probably goes back. I stopped collecting in 1992 and I'll go past that. I don't know why. But that, that's my cutoff year. 1992 and under, I will buy collections. So I've got boxes and boxes over here and it's just, uh, to me, it's, they're amazing. I'll sit there for a good day and just grab a stack and go through them. It's just, it's something cool. It brings up something about your memory. And that's when like, you know, wrestling was good. Wrestling was great. It was fantastic. There's something believable about a lot of that stuff in those magazines. Who was in the ratings? Who was in the top 10 in January, yeah. 1981? You know, it's, it's like, it just, it's always good. 
It's always the best. When I would bring home a stack of magazines, say when I got my first job uh, cleaning, my dad was a television repairman. I got, I, I would go to his store with him, and I would help clean the TVs after he fixed them. You know what I mean? And he sold used TVs as well in the shop. I would clean them up. I would restain them because a lot of them they were made from actual wood. So you know, I'd, I'd stain them up, and then every time he'd pay me, he'd pay me forty five dollars a week. <laughs> so. We'd stop in the newsstand every Friday on the way home. I'd come home with a stack of magazines. I'd sit in my room. The first section I would go to was the ratings every, ep- every issue. Yep. And guess I what I got? to see what uh, uh, what the groups were in there other than WWF, the mm-hmm. NWA. I would go, oh, this uh, PWF out of wherever or what have you. You know, some weird group. And then I would always try finding them somehow. The highlight of my... Western Magazine's career was doing the ratings. They gave them to me to do. My friend never got old. No. It, it was did fun. You, I, and I was ser- I was I want the fans listening to know, even though I did the ratings, I was as serious doing them as you were reading them. Yeah. I took that stuff seriously and compiled one loss records and weighed the different types of victories like DQ wins and count out wins. Everything was legit. Say what you want about Matt Brock and Liz Hunter, okay? That's a whole different ball of wax. But the ratings, that was my dog, and yeah. he grew up to be a, a good dog. I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I I love doing the I love doing the ratings. Loved it because I, I know other people liked it too. You know, it was important to people. I know that's the first thing I turned to as well, just like you. That, yeah, that and you know, remember like uh, some of the magazines had extensive results uh, sections as well. Oh, the kites are books. Yeah. And I would literally go through them. I'd grow. Oh, me too. There was this group out of New Hampshire that ran a Mm -hmm. show that had, I don't know, name some random guy, you know, on a show. Tony Atlas on the show. What was this? I mean, how do I find this? And then it was like, you know, some of the other magazines had, you know, ways that you can get in touch with other fans, guys that were tape traders, guys that had their own newsletters. That's how I just got put in touch with a lot of tape traders and that before the internet and we used to do tape trading prior to the internet and then the internet you know i would literally at one point i was getting tapes every day in the mail because of tape trading it was amazing Mm -hmm. sure you know it's funny too talking about those magazines i get pages with the results it's like it's like um there used to be a a jobber in the wwwf called mark pole Mm -hmm. and i'm flipping through one of the kites books there's a picture with a belt on it said he was the new york state champion i'm like when, how, where? I'd like, I need to know about this. What is this? Mark Pohl? You know, he was, yeah. you know, you could turn on the TV, he's getting squashed by Baron Von Raschke or somebody like that. But it's like, wow, how, why? That's what I loved about the magazines. They yeah. covered every little nook and cranny of the wrestling world, you know. The that first was probably time, some little federation out of Brooklyn or maybe what Johnny yeah. Rods was doing, you know. The, the first time I ever saw probably say Iron Mike Sharp win a match uh, in my, you know, was on an ICW show, or IWCCW show, and I was just like, "Whoa, this is the most amazing thing ever!" Every week he's getting killed on WWF TV. You know, of course, late '80s he was at least. Then I saw him—I uh, forgot who the hell he beat—but he loaded up his uh, wrist wristband and smacked the guy right across the back and pinned him. I popped because I couldn't believe that he actually won. <laughs> <laughs> WWF had a bad habit of taking old made inventors and shoving them out the door by jobbing them out the out the way. And I didn't think it was fair. I just thought it was kind of you. I'd almost rather see the guys get fired than have to lose on TV every week. You know, I just it didn't feel right because I know how great in, they all were at one point. It, when he came in, he like now of course I learned over the years through reading history and videotape and stuff like that. When he came in, he was actually a threat to Backlund's title. That's exactly right. Yeah, so he he ended up headlining at was it MSG or Philadelphia Spectrum? One of yeah. those. Yeah, no, he he got the run. He got to do the yeah. run. I think. Yeah. yeah, and then what? A year later, he's winning in three minutes every week. Right, it's insane to think about some of those it's, guys it's that crazy. happened to. You know, you know, back backless reign was tarred by I think Vince Senior who brought in the gamiest collection of old guys to take on. He brought in Bulldog Brower passes prime, brought in Sweet Hanson passes prime. Pat Patterson actually t- worked out because he was still Pat Patterson at that point. Yeah. yeah. I think Patterson and Backlund went four times in a row at the Garden, which is, must be some kind of a record. Wow. Four months in a row at the Garden. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. But, he, you know, Mike Sharp, the guys he was bringing in were not the greatest. 
I don't right. I don't even know why he couldn't bring in better contenders. But then they were bringing a sweet hand, or, excuse me, a Stan Hansen. Yeah. You know, at the same time. So, but for some reason, Vince Senior, right before he retired, was bringing in these old guys to take on Backlund, and it just didn't look right at all. I don't yeah, know if it's weird. because he wanted to keep the, the belt on Backlund longer. I don't. I don't know, but it was weird. I don't know if you remember that period, but somewhat. That was kind of the era. Like I was kind of getting into it, so I I was you know more than well aware of professional wrestling. I watched it somewhat, but like I said, a couple years later, I was fully as obsessed. That, tell my friend, tell people where they can find you. You got anything else going on? Let them know it right here. All right. Well, you can find me uh, on Instagram. That's what I use the most, uh, PWZ Network at. Or you can find me uh, on Twitter at the Rick Del Santo. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to show a plug here for one of my shows sure. coming up. Sure. Uh, August 4th, 2023, West Haven, Connecticut, Coliseum Pro. Presents Clash at the Coliseum. Uh, we're, uh, you know, if you guys want to get in touch, find out more information, you can check out Coliseum Pro Wrestling at uh, Instagram, or you can hit up uh, Coliseum Pro Wrestling 2023 at gmail.com. We're looking, you know, they're uh, looking for vendors and sponsors. So if anybody wants to uh, get in touch, we'd really appreciate it. Very cool. Yeah. And that not just Connecticut people, anybody in the East Coast who's looking anybody for some, at all. some old school flavor, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're going to have a lot of fun. I promise you that you will have a lot of fun. Or I'll personally refund your ticket. How's that sound? Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fail-safe deal right there, folks. Get out there. Um, any, any, and now how do they get a hold of you? I, they know how to get the, the podcast, but are there any emails or? Yeah, you can hit uh, Pro WrestleZone, Pro WrestleZone at gmail.com. I, uh, I do have a blog, but I have not updated it in months. So just, let's just forget that. <laughs> I haven't. I got to work on that. I got. I've been bad at that as of late. But you know, that's it. Just hit me up, prowrestlezone at gmail .com. You can find me on YouTube as well uh, under the same name. And uh, yeah, man, and you're on please. Facebook. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can find me on Facebook under my name, Rick Del Santo. And uh, don't be afraid to say hello. And uh, do, you know, dude, you know how you know this is the outdated wrestling hours because every time that I do my ending thing, I leave something out. <laughs> Every time I forget. I'll leave out that's the right. Twitter or the Facebook or something else that's going on. And I do it all the time. Yeah. I, 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 for the first six episodes of the show, I had a, a, a specified Gmail address for the show and I never mentioned it. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> you know, you but I want you folks to get PWZ pro wrestle zone. Listen to it. It's available pretty much wherever podcasts are available. Right. Uh, everywhere. It's available every format you can find, uh, Spotify, Apple, uh, obviously YouTube, you'll get the video version. Um, and, uh, what's the other one there? Oh, I heart radio speaker. Um, we are on television on Sunday mornings out of Brooklyn, uh, Sunday afternoons, excuse me, on WWON. Uh, that's also available on the Roku app. If you want to watch us. Is that right? So, yeah. 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 You told yeah, me something I didn't know. Yeah, so uh, that's something new. We're looking to get on uh, another network or two uh, to help us get across the United States a little bit. So God knows, you know, I'm uh, just trying to get the name out there and provide good content for people. I don't want any money. I just want to provide good professional wrestling content and get people to watch this stuff. Well, I mean, he's the professor. He's Rick Del Santo. Thanks for being here, man. I I, I owed you this one and uh, check this guy out. He's got some good stuff for you and the price is right. I'll tell you that much. You know, I really am getting old because we're starting to forget important things I should be telling you, and I'm just squeezing this into the podcast. On Saturday, July 1st, I will be attending the Icons of Wrestling Convention and Fan Fest in Philadelphia. The website is iconsofwrestling.net. Tons of great stars are going to be at that thing. I'm going to be there from 10 o'clock till 3 p.m. I uh, got myself a table. I, I don't know where it's going to be located. It could be with the vendors. could be somewhere else. I don't know. But I'm definitely going to be there. Bring your PWI magazines inside wrestling, the wrestler, whatever you want signed. Everything is free. I'm not selling anything. I'm just there to spread word about the podcast. And, um, you know, I have some pictures, stuff like that. Come and say hi. I'm really looking forward to meeting everybody in Philly, maybe seeing some of my good Philly friends if they can take the time to stop out. Remember, it's the Icons of Wrestling Convention and Fan Fest. 2300 Arena in Philadelphia. 
provided, of course, they fix the uh, area there. I, I understand they had a very bad uh, road collapse, so this could be a little hairy getting there. Who knows? Um, as we as we go to uh, record, uh, the news is pretty bad out of Philly. I uh, hope everybody is safe and well there. But in the meantime, I am scheduled to be at the Icons of Wrestling Convention July 1st, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning in Philadelphia. If you can be there, come say hi. You know, this is the fun of doing these podcasts, at least for me, in, in terms of uh, time element. I really like bringing people into the forefront that you may not have heard of. That's the whole idea of this podcast. A community of people who enjoy traditional professional wrestling and want to keep that memory going. It's not that tough to figure out when you think about it. And there's plenty of us out there. We may be a little grayer. We may be a little fatter. We may be a little balder. We may be a little slower. But our memories are still keen and Rick's is keen and mine is keen. And we miss a lot of the elements that made wrestling what it was and what it should be today. So now we have a megaphone. And we're going to use it. And there's people like Jim Cornette, who's my hero. I don't care what people like Mr. Neckbeard and Miss Nose Ring have to say about it. And all the names they're calling him and all the the uh, accusations they make about him. Bull. Jim Cornette's a great guy. Period. Full stop. End of story. I just lost everybody under the age of 18, but that's fine. <laughs> you know, because he's a great guy. Jim, Jim, ask anybody who's ever met him or knew him. Ask, ask, ask all his contemporaries. Jim Cornette's a genius. And his, and his podcast is number one in the ratings week after week because he's the best. B-E-S-T. Close the door, lock the safe. That's all there is to it. And I'm proud to say that. So in any event, um, this is our show for this week. We're going to do that trivia quiz. I believe we have our, our uh, contestants lined up. You're going to be shocked when you find out who they are. We're going to have a lot of fun with this. So in the meantime, if you want to get in on it, just write to us one way or another, and we'll see if we can squeeze you in. But right now, I was looking for three contestants. I think I've got them wrapped up, but um, get on the stick. I have picked out a prize. It is in my possession. I hope it's something everyone will enjoy. No, it's not a car, but <laughs> I will send you a little something for winning this contest uh, and taking part in it. Something I really like, and I hope you'll like it too. Our Gmail is outdatedwrestling at gmail.com. Facebook, I'm Bob Smith. Look for me singing with B.B. King. That's right. I sang with B.B. King. A lot, by the way. Our website, where you can hear every edition of the show, is outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. For those of you who are a little app-phobic, log in. Press a button, every show is there. Twitter, where I'm still at, I really shouldn't be. Bob Smith, NYC. And that's it for this edition. I hope you had a gas. I know I did. So before I leave you, here are the words of the great, well, one of the greatest referees, Tommy Young. He used to work in the NWA, and uh, after a certain match, it was a controversial decision. He was being interviewed afterwards, and he literally said, well, you know, I could be wrong. (laughs) 